Let's take a look then at an actual example from my university student's homework. Please write out net ionic equations for the reactions that occur in each of the following cases. Then identify the spectator ion or ions in each reaction. To write out a balanced net ionic equation, you have to go through the steps that I've outlined in earlier videos linked to in the description below. Step one is do your partner swap. In the compound on the left, I've got chromium stuck to sulfate. Compound on the right, I've got ammonium and H4 stuck to carbonate CO3. What I'm going to do is trade partners. So the thing in the left, the, this chromium, ends up going with the partner on the right and the compound on the right. So these two go together, and then the NH4 goes with the sulfate. Now, when you do this initial partner swap, you do not bring subscripts along with you, at least not initially. The subscripts, for example, here are 2 and 3 and 2. Now, these subscripts in the polyatomic ions, this 4 and this 4 and this 3, are not considered subscripts for this uh, step, at least. Because NH4, for example, the 4 is just part of the NH4. Don't treat that 4 as a separate subscript. Just treat NH4 as one blob unit, OK? Same thing with the 3 and the CO3 and the 4 and the SO4, just one blob unit, OK? We don't look at those as subscripts for bookkeeping purposes in this step. So again, what I'm going to do is do the partner swap, and I'll bring everything over after the partner swap, leaving the subscripts behind, OK? So my partner swap is now done. Now I'm going to figure out what the charges were of everything on the left and bring those charges over. And then from those charges, figure out where, if any place, I need to put subscripts. OK, over here, chromium, if you look on the periodic table, you'll notice that it is in the D block, which means that you cannot just look at chromium and instantly know exactly what charge it has in any given compound. D blockers don't have that giveaway charge, OK? So what do we do? How do we figure out chromium's charge? by back calculating from the charge of the thing it's stuck to, in this case, the sulfate. Now, sulfate is one of those polyatomics I've required you to memorize, and I'll put the link to that memorization video or that list in the description below. It has a charge of negative 2. Okay, So I'm just going to write negative 2, just for bookkeeping purposes, as the charge over the sulfate. Turns out that will also be its charge here on the right, because in one of these exchanges, these are really double displacement placement, uh, partner swap exchanges or reactions. Uh, also called metathesis reactions, the charges do not change as you go from left to right, okay? What is chromium's charge going to be? We might remember in an earlier video, again linked to in the description below, that the subscript that's tied to the thing on the right is actually the charge for the thing on the left. So I could bring this 3 up and put a plus in front of it. That is the charge for the chromium. It's a plus 3. This 2, if I bring it up here and add a negative to it, is the charge for the sulfate. Again, sulfate is one of those polyatomics I require you to memorize the charge. And, uh, formula 4, but you can go that route. So this 3 just comes up here. That's the charge for the chromium. So I'll go ahead and lay down a 3 right there for the chromium. This 2 right here, I bring it up there, slap a negative onto it. That's the charge for the sulfate. Okay? Can I do the same process over here? Absolutely. This 2 is tied to the ammonium, NH4. Okay? So if I bring that up here and write a negative next to it, that is the charge for carbonate. Again, carbonate happens to be one of those polyatomics that I require you to memorize. So you would have known that anyway. Nevertheless, this is a good bookkeeping tool. So I can just bring that 2 up there, slap a negative on there. That's the charge for the carbonate. So for bookkeeping, I'll write down the negative 2 next to carbonate on the right. What about NH4? Again, that's a polyatomic ion I require you to memorize. It has a plus 1 charge. But how can you derive that by looking at this? You look at the subscript next to the carbonate. Now again, I hope that I'm emphasizing this enough. The 3 here, don't look at it as a subscript. The reason is because the CO3 is a polyatomic I require you to memorize. You just look at that as one lump. What you're looking for as a subscript is whatever is to the right of the 3. In other words, if there's parentheses around the CO3 and there's another number, that is a subscript. Because there's no other number next to the CO3, it's an implied 1. Okay, So I bring that 1 up here and write it next to the NH4 with a plus next to it. That is the charge of NH4. And the NH4 is a polyatomic ion that I require you to memorize. Again, you should know that it's plus 1. Okay, So we brought all the charges over. And now, Based on these charges, we will add subscripts wherever necessary, OK? So here I've got chromium plus 3. I'm going to take this number 3 and bring it down here next to the carbonate. That will be the subscript for the carbonate. Now, whenever you put subscripts next to polyatomics, you have to wrap parentheses around them, OK? Now, by analogy, I'm going to take this 2 down here, put it next to the chromium. That is chromium's subscript. Over here, I'm going to take this 1, bring it down here as a subscript for the sulfate. When we have a 1 as a subscript, we don't really write it. It's just understood. We sort of ignore 1s. And then this 2 I will bring down here as a subscript for the NH4. I have to wrap parentheses around the NH4 because it's a polyatomic. So now I've successfully put all of my subscripts where they belong and done the partner swap. That is the end of step 1. Step 2 is 
balance the resulting equation. Before I get to that, I'm gonna erase the charges now in order to clear things off the board and make things a little bit easier. Step two now is use the solubility table in order to identify what things are soluble and what things are insoluble on this equation. Now we do not have to do that for the things on the left because it gave it to us in the problem. It tells us that they're both aqueous, which means aqueous, which means soluble. We just have to do it for the things on the right. Now let's take a look at that solubility table, keeping in mind our chromium carbonate. We're looking with cr a chromium carbonate, okay? So here's the solubility table. If you look at the solubility table, you'll see that chromium does not appear anywhere on it. But carbonate does, it's the CO3 two minus down here, okay? The bottom half of the solubility table is the insolubles. Okay, so carbonates are all insoluble. That means that they're not soluble in water, except for NH4 carbonates, ammonium carbonates, right? As well as column one or group one metals on the periodic table. Now, chromium is not any of those, which means it is not an exception. Therefore, chromium carbonate is insoluble. Now, remember, for insolubles, we write the letter S next to them. So I'm going to write kind of an S down here, indicating this is an insoluble solid precipitate, okay? Now let's do the same thing for NH4 sulfate, that is ammonium sulfate. We look at the solubility table, you'll see that ammonium doesn't really appear, at least in column two, but sulfate does. It appears down here, it's in the top half of the table, which is the solubles half. Sulfates are all soluble in water except for strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, mercury sulfate, and lead sulfate. Is ammonium any of those exceptions, NH4 plus? It is not, which means that ammonium sulfate is water soluble, hence we write down an AQ next to it. Remember, AQ stands for soluble or aqueous soluble, I guess. Is that okay? We're now done with step two. Step three is we balance the chemical equation. Using principles that I discussed in an earlier video linked to in the description below, we wanna make sure that everything balances. Now remember, once you've written down the subscript so that we have all of our charges balanced in, within each compound, we cannot change subscripts. Subscripts are done, they're written in stone. We can only balance things by adding coefficients, numbers to the left. That's the big numbers to the left of each substance. I like to do this by just reading left to right. So chromium here, there are two chromiums on the left of the equation, and on the right side of the equation, there are two chromiums. So chromiums are all good. How about sulfate? Sulfate, well, I've got one, and again, it's easier if you, for balancing if you just view the SO4 as one clump, okay? I don't think about the four as being four octogens and the sulfur is one. It's a lot easier for bookkeeping. I just treat the SO4 as a single lump, okay? So I have SO4 on the left, and I have parentheses wrapped around it with a three here, so there are actually three SO4s on the left. On the right, oh, I only have one SO4, so how do I fix that? I'm gonna add a coefficient. Specifically, I'm gonna add a three here to the left of this, and I'm gonna have to insert my little plus there. So I now have three, and the three multiplies all the way through, so now I have three SO4s on the right, and I have three SO4s on the left. SO4 is good. Now we go to NH4. On the left side of the equation, I've got two NH4s, because I've got a little two here, wrapped around, or you know, beneath the parentheses, wrapped around NH4. On the right, I don't have two, I've got three times two, and yes, these multiply by each other, I have six. So I've got a two down there, and I've got two here, how can I fix that? Well, I bet if I put a three right here, that will fix it, right? Because now I've got three times two, I have now six NH4s on the left and six on the right. How about the carbonates? On the right side, now that I put that three down there, I now have three, and this three multiplies through, I have three CO3s. And again, view the CO3 as just one unit, okay? Three CO3s. On the right, do I have three CO3s? Yes, I do, because I've got the parentheses wrapped around the th CO3, and I have a little three there. So everything's balanced now, we're done with that step. The next step that's also kind of complicated is for everything that has an AQ next to it. You have to cut it in half, separating out the cations from the anions. Why do we do that? The reason is because AQ means that that thing will actually dissolve in water. And when things dissolve in water, ionic things at least, they separate out. The anions and the cations separate from each other. And that's what I'm telling you when I say we're cutting them in half. Because that's what happens. I take, for example, chromium sulfate. It has an AQ next to it. I throw that in water. The chromium and the sulfate part ways and separate from each other. That's why we're cutting it in half. So I just initially write down a little line here. I'm cutting the chromium away from the sulfate. And over here, this says AQ, so I'm gonna cut the cation NH4 away from the carbonate. And over here, I've got chromium carbonate. It's a solid, which means it does not dissolve. So I do not cut it in half, okay? I leave it stuck to each other. Over here, though, I have aqueous ammonium sulfate. So I will cut that in half, okay? Now, when you cut things in half, 
two things occur. I'm going to rewrite it down here. Subscripts become coefficients and charges get revealed. So for example, you see this two next to the chromium, it's a subscript. It's going to come out here and become a coefficient. Okay, so I'm going to write two chromium. And the other thing is that the chromium's charge gets revealed. Now I know I erased its charge before, but it was a plus three. So I'm going to write plus three next to it. And now that chromium plus three is floating around in the water by itself. Separately, I've got the sulfate. It separates out, and this three that's a subscript for the sulfate comes out front as a coefficient, and the sulfate's charge, which we know is two minus, gets revealed, okay? And I'm gonna write aqueous next to that. So now I have my free sulfate floating around. Now I'm gonna go on and do the same thing over here. This two subscript next to the NH4 comes out front and becomes a coefficient. Now I've got a three out here already, so what do I do when this two and this three hit each other? When they bang into each other? Yeah, I multiply them by each other, so two, times three is six, so I get six NH4s, and the NH4's charge, of course, which is plus one, also gets unveiled, and I'll write AQ underneath it. So now this has hit water, and my NH4, or my six NH4s are now floating around freely. Over here, the carbonate has no subscript. It's an implied one, so it just comes and gets dissolved out as CO3, but its charge does get unveiled. And again, I erased it, because it was getting a little bit messy on the board, but its charge was two minus, okay? And you can go back in the video and see just to make sure I'm not lying there, all right? Now I'm gonna write down the right side of the equation, do the analogous process, but we kinda of don't have enough room on the board to do the right side to the right of here, so I'm gonna write it as a second line with the yield sign right here, okay? So this is a saw, which means we do not cut it in half, we just leave it completely as is, which means that in this case, chromium carbonate is not water soluble, so it goes into the water and it just stays, it remains as a solid insoluble precipitate. Now I will do the analogous thing for this thing because this is obviously soluble because it has an AQ next to it. This subscript comes out here, becomes a coefficient. When the two and the three bang into each other, boom, they multiply. So two times three is six. So I have six NH4s. And again, the charges get unveiled when the aqueous species dissolves out. What is the charge on NH4? Again, it is plus one. And I'm going to go ahead and write down AQ underneath it. What about the SO4? Well, I've got this three, and this three multiplies through. So that three will be tied or attached to the SO4. So I'll write down SO4. It's also AQ, and I unveil its charge when this thing separates out. SO4's charge is two minus. Again, you can go back earlier in the video to make sure that I'm not lying on that. We're now done with that step of cutting everything in half. The process is long and involved, and probably I think one of the most difficult concepts in all of general chemistry, to be honest, but once we're done at this stage, everything is a little bit nicer. Because at this stage, we go to the last step, which is cancel anything that's the same on the left side of the equation, that is on the left side, or in this case, the top half of the equation of the yield sign, as well as on the right side. So you'll notice that I've got CR3 plus over here. I do not have any CR3 plus by itself floating around down here. But the sulfates, I've got three sulfates on the left, and I have the exact same thing on the right, so I can cancel them out. Wow, canceling that out, that's beautiful. How about the NH4 plus? I've got that on the left, that is on the top, but it's really supposed to be the left of this equation, and I have the same thing on the right, so I'll cancel those out. These are called spectator ions, because what this means is that when you throw these two substances, chromium sulfate and ammonium carbonate, into a bucket together and start floating them around in water, these ions all dissolve out and stay dissolved out. They don't recombine to form anything because they wouldn't precipitate, because they don't form precipitates. Instead, the only thing that actually happens when you throw these two substances together in water is that once everything dissolves out and all the ions are separate, the chromium three plus gets together with the CO3, the carbonate two minus, to form solid chromium carbonate. So when we're all done, we write the net ionic equation being everything that's left over, which is this equation right here. Yeehaw!